Night Times Thursday magazine is made possible by a grant from the Pillsbury Company Foundation on behalf of Totinos. From the Twin Cities, this is Night Times Magazine with Gary Gilson. Good evening. On tonight's program, we visit former Channel 5 anchorman Ron Majors in Chicago. That's where he went to work when he quit KSTP, and he talks here for the first time about why he quit. Next, another story about quitting, this time the coffee habit. Joining me in the studio will be the author of a book that tells you how and why you should kick coffee. And then it's on to the Orpheum Theater in Minneapolis for a conversation with James Earl Jones, the distinguished actor who's here this week playing Othello. I really enjoyed being with him, and I think you will, too. First, let's go to Chicago. Producer Bill Hanley found Ron Majors there working for the NBC television station WMAQ. When Majors quit KSTP last summer, his contract with that station kept him from going to any other station here in the Twin Cities, and that stipulation holds for one full year. Whenever I hear people talk about Ron Majors, I hear them saying they like him because he's real, serious-minded, not plastic. In other words, in the TV news business, a rare bird. The question is, will he come back to the nest? You remember Ron Majors. Sure you do. He used to work for this station. For seven years, Ron Majors was KSTP's lead anchor, the face and voice of KSTP News for tens of thousands of people in the Twin Cities. Some say he was the chief reason for the news division's strength during the late 1970s. Today, there's a restaurant not far from KSTP where hangs one of the old station bus boards. All the old familiar faces are there, except one. Someone has tried to blot his face right off the ad. We found Ron Majors in Chicago, working, perhaps surprisingly, not as a regular anchorman, but as a street reporter for WMAQ-TV, the NBC station. Is there life after KSTP? Is there? Yeah. What is it for you? Uh, it's very enjoyable. Very enjoyable, not uh, regularly anchoring newscasts. It's enjoyable being on the street again. It's enjoyable doing some of the stuff that I originally thought was fun when I got into the business. Mm -hmm. It's enjoyable going to restaurants, uh, having people point at you. <laughs> Three, two, one. So all of the talking is done. Each side has had its say. And Carl every day is different, uh, and every day is a challenge. Anchoring is not a difficult job. Uh, you know, I w in, when I was in the second grade, I was in the Bluebirds reading group, and we weren't supposed to know that the Bluebirds were the best readers, but we figured out that we were better readers than the Robins and the sparrows and uh, that was about all the recognition I ever needed for my reading and that's basically what anchoring has become. For right now it's a, a wonderful break not to be doing it and, and it's very challenging to do the street work. Despite the fact that Majors has only been reporting in Chicago for a short time, he has apparently impressed a number of people including the TV critic for the Chicago Tribune, Ron Allridge. Ron is new to our market and I haven't seen everything he's done or certainly not everything he's going to do but I have said in my column that I'm impressed with him. I, he seems to have a kind of a no-nonsense approach. He, uh, he seems to not let his own personality get in the way of delivering the news. I hear from his shop that he is somewhat of a leader in the house or is an emerging leader which is important I think for an anchor uh, and seems to be a, a, a serious journalist. It's clear from what Allrich and others are saying that Ron Majors won't stay a street reporter for long. More about that later. But for now, Majors seems honestly to be enjoying his work in Chicago. On this day, however, he did seem to be having a bit of a hard time finding his way around. Oh, go ahead. Having any difficulty finding your way around Chicago, Ron? Uh, <laughs> no, it's no problem at all. Seriously, it's not. I know this building like the back of my hand. <laughs> I like living in Chicago. Urban centers are very dynamic places. Uh, I think in places like New York and L.A. and Chicago and several other places, decisions are being made that are going to determine whether the uh, American system of cities will survive. And there are upheavals in the social order in our country, and you get to cover them here. 
Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul is relatively placid uh, in those terms, and it's a wonderful place to live, <clears throat> but in terms of covering the news, it, it's not the mainstream of what's happening in America. Live on Five, from Chicago's News Center, Channel Five. In his cramped and undecorated office at WMAQ, there is only one visible reminder of Ron Major's seven years in Minneapolis. It's a reminder, too, of a continuing mystery still surrounding the former KSTP anchorman. Why did you leave uh, KSTP anyways? <laughs> I'm curious as to why that seems to be a burning question in Minneapolis. Why did Ron Majors leave KSTP? In the five months since he left KSTP, Ron Majors has never publicly commented on the reasons for his resignation. In agreeing to this interview last week in Chicago, he assured us that he would have nothing to say on the subject. But when we asked him about the relative quality of TV news in the Twin Cities, his answer was a surprise. Um, I think generally television news in Minneapolis-St. Paul is very good. Uh, I think WCCO does an excellent job in news. I think KSTP does a competitive job in certain aspects of the news. A competitive job in certain aspects of the news. Why such faint praise from a man who for so many years was KSTP news in the eyes of so many of us? Only at this point would Majors begin talking about the frustrations which eventually led to his resignation. There were also from time to time rules that were set forth by Stanley Hubbard or other management people about the kinds of things you would cover and how to cover them that I didn't agree with and that I felt made the job more difficult than it should be. Mm -hmm. Talking about issues? You, I mean, you're talking about trying to do longer issues kinds of pieces? I don't want to belabor this, but I am interested. Um, in... During the newspaper strike in Minneapolis, for example, Mr. S. E. Hubbard issued an edict that we would not do any stories on the newspaper strike. That is the kind of attitude that I feel handcuffs a news department and doesn't allow them to do a good job. Okay. And, and, and you perceive that was because it was a not a particularly good television story? No, I, I grant the Hubbards the right to do whatever they want with their television station. They own it. Mm -hmm. They can make that decision. I don't like that kind of decision. Uh, so if I don't like that kind of decision, I, I better remove myself from it. It didn't seem to be a decision based on how difficult the story was to do. It seemed to me to be just a whim because Mr. Hubbard doesn't particularly like the newspapers that we shouldn't give them, uh, in his words, free publicity about their strike. Contacted in Hong Kong this week, Stanley S. Hubbard said that Major's charges were untrue. From Miami Beach, Stanley E. Hubbard called them a damned lie. From Chicago's News Center. As we said earlier, Ron Majors has met with such great success in Chicago that it appears he won't be staying as a mere street reporter for long. Already, he anchors WMAQ's late Sunday news, and according to the critics, the word is that he has an even brighter future ahead of him in Chicago. Well, the word is, and nobody's admitting it, of course, is that Majors came here for, to be a major anchor, and in Chicago, that's a 10 o'clock anchor job. Uh, they, uh, his station is, is a decided number three at 10 o'clock, and that is the most important anchor job in Chicago. Uh, I think what the station wants to do is season majors, give him more street experience in Chicago, uh, move him in as they've already done into some backup anchor work, and then see how that, that's going uh, before making a decision on where to go next with him. Although it's clear that Ron Majors looks forward to additional anchor responsibilities in Chicago, he still has misgivings about the role of consultants and formulas in the future of TV news. I said a long time ago, if somebody had some success with a left-handed monkey reading the news, we'd all be out of work and it'd all be left-handed monkeys. Um, television sees a formula and then runs it in the ground. Rich Samuels joins us now for part one of High Crimes with an overall look at who's getting rich off the drug users. Rich? Ron, last year the illicit drug business... Doesn't it strike you odd that uh, I claim as a result of the influence of consultants you go from Topeka to Peoria to San Francisco to Great Falls, Montana, and all those television newscasts are going to look a little bit alike. That says to me that the very system itself is constraining what we do. People are not breaking new ground. They don't look 
radically different from one another. And, and I feel very sad for our business about that. Anything else you'd like to say to the people of Minneapolis and St. Paul who are <laughs> yearning for you to return? <laughs> I really appreciate that. I, I had a wonderful success in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I met some wonderful people, lifelong friendships, I hope, that will be maintained. And it's sad for me when I talk about it because in terms of leaving an area, I didn't want to leave the area. Well, this is your last chance. You're sure you won't return? You never close any doors. See, the first rule in this business is you talk to everybody. And you never burn any bridges. Well, you try not to. <laughs> Some of them get singed a little. <laughs> Won't you come home, Ron Majors? Won't you come home? All is forgiven, my son. No reflection on Brucato, but we really think you ought to. Get Channel 5 News back to number one. We need you here, Ron Majors. We need you here to get us through the winter freeze. We don't need nine meteorologists. We just need TV psychologists. Ron Majors, we're down on our knees. Ron, how could you leave us? Come back. Come back from Chicago, Ron. We miss you. Ron who? Whatever it takes, Ron Majors, whatever it takes. You don't like the news that day. Well, make up your own news. We don't care. Even reading gibberish, we'd love to see you there, won't you? Won't you come home, Ron Majors? Won't you come home? You're much more than a blow-dried hairstyle. You're what television ought to be. TV news with no lobotomy. Now if you only look a little more like Pat Miles. Come back, Ron. Come, come back, back, Ron Majors. Majors. Please come back, Ron Majors. We miss you. You get the feeling that they miss Ron Majors? Do you get the feeling sometimes that almost anything that you like to eat or drink is suspected of causing cancer, like bacon or beer or saccharin or scotch? Maybe you can live without them, but what happens when you find out that scientists have discovered a link between cancer of the pancreas and the drinking of coffee? Does that panic the more than 100 million Americans who indulge? I love coffee, I love tea, I love the Java Jive and it loves me. My mother lived to be 95 years old and she drank coffee all her life. I'm going to keep on drinking coffee. A cup, a cup, a cup, a cup, a cup. And the cups do add up. If you're an average coffee drinker, then you probably drink about three and a half cups a day an amount many doctors say is harmful to your health. And if you drink six or more cups a day, you may be addicted to the stuff. I, uh, uh, I got to have it. I can, I can quit smoking, but I can't drink, quit drinking uh, coffee. I'm an industrial hygiene, and I don't give a damn if coffee causes cancer. You only live once, you know, and if you have to go around being scared of this and scared of that, you know, you, what's the sensor? What kind of life do you even have, you know? A cup, a cup, a cup, a cup. Here's a book called Kicking the Coffee Habit. It's by Charles Weatherall, who lives here in Minneapolis, who publishes it. And uh, what do you have, Mr. Weatherall, about trying to save people from themselves? They don't want to cooperate with you. I don't think the situation is probably much different as it was when they first discovered that cigarette smoking caused a great variety of ailments, including heart disease and lung cancer. There was a lot of disbelievers. And I think over the years, at least since 1964, when the report was issued, I think the believers are coming around. They're now quitting. And I have the same belief about coffee. Well, you were a coffee drinker? I was for most of my life until about a year and a half ago. How serious? Well, I was an addictive drinker. I began at about eight, eight cups a day, and then I, I gradually worked up, and I was drinking about 16 cups a day. What can it do to you? Well, just about everything, uh, including pancreatic cancer. And I think we should point out that these are associated and they are not caused by coffee, but they are associated with it. And they include uh, pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer, uh, fibrocystic breast tumors. There's some uh, evidence that suggests it's linked to breast cancer, heart disease, 
hypoglycemic disorders, of course, uh, central nervous system problems, which we're all familiar with, birth defects, and the list goes on and on and on. So you think people should stop drinking coffee? Absolutely. Even Absolutely. if they only drink two cups a day, how much well, can it hurt? Well, according to the statistics, uh, two cups a day will increase your risk of uh, having pancreatic cancer by just about double. So it is a problem. And pancreatic cancer, of course, is just about 95% fatal. So if you get it, the chances are you're going to die. How do you quit? Well, I would recommend one or two ways. Uh, uh, for most people, I think cold turkey is the way to go. I think uh, you have to come to a firm understanding and a firm belief that this is the way to go, that coffee is, in fact, harmful to you. Without that belief, I don't think you'll quit. And a lot of people have that belief because they experience many of these problems that we're talking about. Armed with that sort of commitment, I think they can just turn it off. Other people should probably taper. They should go to a decaffeinated coffee or drink half decaffeinated, half regular, or switch tea, or taper down in some fashion. Well, do you think that people are really going to do that? I think many will. I think probably what happens is a book like this will strike nerves in people that uh, they'll start putting two to two together, and they'll summon up from their own body of experience uh, some of their own problems, the sleepless nights, the, the, and particularly women with fibrocystic breast tumors. Uh, it's only been a couple of years since uh, they've linked it, and people have it, and they quit, and they go away. I love coffee, and I learned to love it when I was probably a year and a half or two years old, but I don't drink it. Mm -hmm. uh, if I have one cup a month, it's a lot, uh, because I just feel like I don't need it, and I have this feeling that it probably isn't any good for mm -hmm. me. But most of the people I know do, and we sit and talk in restaurants, and somebody comes over and says, uh, how'd you like me to freshen that up for you? <laughs> And, you know, I would just soon sit there and talk with them for an hour, but they mm -hmm. feel like they need something in that cup to talk with. I think that's where most coffee drinkers are at. It's mostly habit. I think many coffee drinkers need a cup in the morning or feel they need a cup in the morning or maybe even two cups. But then the coffee pot is on and they go back and they go back and they go back all day long and many into the night. Uh, I just recently heard that the idea that coffee helps you wake up in the morning is not true? Uh, not true as far as I'm concerned. It's, caffeine can get your body going. There's no question about that, and that's been known for thousands of years. But there's so many other more healthful ways to get going in the morning. To say the least, exercise would be excellent. And there's also all kinds of coffee alternatives that you might get into. I thank you very much for coming in, and I hope you don't go around feeling like a grouch. <laughs> I won't. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. Perdition catch my soul, but I do love thee. And when I love thee not, chaos is come again. Shakespeare's tragedy Othello is playing the Orpheum in Minneapolis through Sunday. The actor playing Othello is James Earl Jones. He is an actor at the very top of his art. He has a presence on the stage you cannot take your eyes off. He is a force. And his voice, his voice is one of our theater's greatest instruments. Excellent wretch. Perdition <laughs> <laughs> catch my soul. And this is a man who struggled through his youth, stuttering. He was born in Mississippi 48 years ago in the Depression. His parents divorced and he grew up in rural Michigan not knowing his father. One of young Jimmy's high school teachers discovered he was a poet and had him read aloud in class. Suddenly, no stuttering. That's the way it's been ever since with written lines. He says he still stutters sometimes in conversation, but has no trouble saying other people's words. He's been saying Othello's words for almost 20 years. He's considered the best we have, and he's still trying to figure the character out. People always ask, why does Othello bite the bait so easily so soon? And I'm still trying to resolve that. What we just James Earl Jones sat with me for the better part of an hour as the set was being built for opening night, and we talked about the play, the theater, and the actor. Actors that I know always talk about craving the kind of experience that will stretch them. Uh, what uh, do you do to stretch yourself as an actor and as a human being? No matter how much film or television I do, I find it always important to come back to stage in general, whether it's uh, Shakespeare or modern works. Um, John Steinbeck. Uh, uh, 
because what you are asked for in the media, in television and in film, is to just be what you are. In fact, a film editor gets a little uh, upset if he finds that you are understanding the character more toward the end of the shoot than you did at the beginning, because he, he's worried that it's going to match, it's going to be the same character. So they'd rather for you to, whatever you enter that, uh, that film, on your first days of shooting, first day of shooting, you stay that way. You look that way, you don't let your beard get longer or grayer or, or your stomach get bigger. You, 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 you're obliged to that image and that manner in a way too. And only if the playwright has, has carved uh, an evolution of character are you expected to change. Therefore, so many of us who work in the media don't have a chance to develop or stretch ourselves. So I find it very necessary to come back to the, to the stage. Because not only are you, are you stretching yourself from role to role, but you're stretching yourself from night to night, trying to keep the experience fresh and alive for each new audience. What moves you in the theater? Chorus line, for instance. Uh, I could see that me. once a week. Yes, hit me deeper than many dramas uh, could hit me. Really? Yeah. yeah. And universally. I mean, just... What about that uh, show? Back to well, you? just that it, it's about losers. And most of us feel, if we're not losers, we're uh, there but for the grace of God. Go I. And when you, <laughs> the moment when the losers were asked to step forward, thinking they were winners, and the winners <laughs> were shocked when they realized that their line was the winning line. It, it, it sort of... It's like the old army maxim, yes. don't ever take one step forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think losers are more interesting than winners? I, when I search for a character, I mean, it's great to play a hero, but the one I'm playing here, uh, Othello, he's a, he's a loser. Not, um, uh, not by any fate of the way his life is constructed, but by an accident that occurs in his life. Uh, I, think, I think we can learn more from the people who are in trouble. That's what tragedies are all about. In Shakespeare's tragedy, Othello, we see the Moorish superstar, general of the Venetian army, filled with his success, his love for his bride, Desdemona, his magnanimity toward mankind, and his trust of his underling, Iago. I cannot speak enough of this content. It stops me here. It is too much of joy. This, and this, Othello's tragedy is that he allows the schemer Iago to make him believe Desdemona is cheating on him. The very jealousy that Othello believed he was immune to consumes him and his world. Come, let's to the castle. News, friends, our wars are done. The Turks are drowned. How does my old acquaintance of this isle? You just used the word accident. Uh, I just dug something out last night from a commentary on Othello by Carl Van Doren. Uh, let me read it to you. He says, Othello is a great and fearful man, one who generates his own tragic atmosphere as he goes, and one, therefore, to whom nothing that happens is utterly accidental. What do you make of that? Ah, it's interesting. Uh, I think the tragedy, uh, the wheels of the tragedy are set in motion by Iago, uh, who is himself a tragic character. It's as if he set out to be a devil's advocate, advocate uh, to everybody who thinks they are in love, says, if you're really in love, let me test you. <laughs> and then the testing always proves our weaknesses. I speak not yet of proof. Look to your wife. Observe her well with Cassio. Wear your idols, but not jealous. Van Doren went on to say that he deserves his tragedy. Well, in that pride always rideth for full, I think Shakespeare was saying that, uh, as rightful as his pride is, uh, as rightful as mine is, as, or as yours is, is still pride. And unless we, we balance our pride with, not humility, but an awareness of all the problems, uh, I think it, it does bring us down or it, it gets taken from us. Uh, whether he deserves it, no, I, I think there was too much potential. You'd have to say that Anwar Sadat deserved his fate, and I don't think that's true. 
What is your uh, life like when you're not on the stage working? Do you have time to read? Uh, what do you prefer to do? What, uh, what are the demands of such a person? Since we left Stratford, I've had time to rest. Barely to rest. And uh, no, reading, unless I'm reading something that has to do with Shakespeare or the period the play is set in or the play itself. No, newspapers, yes, the daily newspapers. And television. I do love watch television, watching television. Um, I make sure there's time set aside for that. But uh, this play has used all, all of my life. You know, uh, uh, we rehearse when there's not a matinee. On a weekday, we are rehearsing the play. I heard an interview recently with Henry Fonda. He says he doesn't really like himself and that he hides behind the sympathetic and likable characters that he plays. Uh, does playing a character help you discover yourself or do you hide behind characters? I, I've met Henry Fonda a few times and uh, no, he's, uh, uh, if he is not the, the boy in uh, Grapes of Wrath, he might as well be <laughs> for me, you know. Uh, I, I like actors. Uh, Sterling Hayden is one of the, the, the few actors who can play John Wayne type rough guys, and he's not a rough guy at all. I like actors who can use aspects of themselves for a character. Heighten it that they wouldn't heighten in, in their normal lives. They have no need to be that slanted. Uh, I, I, I'm often asked to play people that are braver, uh, more heroic, stronger than I have ever been. I'm often asked to play athletes, and I'm not an athlete at all. Uh, I'm often asked to play uh, strong men. I feel that I'm not, I have strength, but I'm not, I don't slap myself into being a strong man in my life. You can't be anything other than what you really are, but you can slant what you are, focus what you are, so that it, it, uh, it fits the slant, slant of the character. Men should be what they see, or those that be not what they might seem not. Sir, men should be what they see. Speaking of drama, we've been treated this week to the results of another CCO News investigative report. The I-Team list of alleged abusers of the public good includes Minneapolis housing inspectors who goof off, people who gamble on sports, and now this latest, the Central States Waterproofing Company. I mentioned all this to our producer. She said, wow, that's comprehensive, impressive, breathtakingly complete. Surely there can't be another example of corruption left in the Twin Cities for the I-Team to expose. You're wrong, Gopher Breath, I said. The nighttime staff has dug up an interminable list of scandals that cry out for I-Team exposés. First, investigate the used car lot in Cottage Grove that allegedly sells only cars lost by Mayor Latimer. <laughs> Get the scoop on snow removal in the Twin Cities. Where does it go? Who profits by it? <laughs> Give me a break. Expose the company that sold the defective calculators to Governor Quee. <laughs> Any suggestions, call in. We'll relay your ideas to Channel 4. Go get them, my team. See you on Tuesday. Nighttime's Thursday magazine is made possible by a grant from the Pillsbury Company Foundation on behalf of Totino's. Nighttime's is a production of KTCA Channel 2, which is solely responsible for its content.